Good day. My name is Matilde Wiem and I am the academic head of the Odeon School of Music. I'm proud to welcome everyone who has tuned in to this virtual book launch of a new publication by my colleague Professor Martina Fuljun entitled A Passage of Nostalgia, The Life and Work of Jakobus Kloppers. Consequently, I welcome in particular Professor Kloppers and Professor Fuljun themselves. Representing the Faculty of the Humanities at the University of the Free State, I welcome our Vice Dean, Professor Chicha Twala. And representing the Odeon School of Music, I welcome Dr. Jan Bierkes, its artistic and operational head, as well as several colleagues. I welcome those guests whom the contributors to tonight's programme have invited, as well as the colleagues from South Africa and Canada who have authored chapters in the volume. Our school takes pride in the release of this volume on the life and work of a figure with whom we have a long-standing involvement, originating in his tenure in the 1970s. While today's event, like the volume, constitutes a recognition of Professor Kloppers' work in South Africa and Canada, we are equally proud to celebrate the academic contribution the volume makes. Not, as Professor Fuljun notes in her introduction, as a disciple, friends and colleagues festschrift, but as a scholarly reflection on the subject's life and work. After these opening remarks of mine, the rest of the programme will proceed with an introductory word by Professor Twala, a presentation on the volume by its editor, Professor Fuljun, an interview with Professor Kloppers, and a short concert presented by staff and students of the Odeon School of Music. I will end with a brief word of thanks to everyone who has made this virtual event possible, namely the speakers, Professor Martina Fuljun, Professor Jakobus Kloppers and Professor Chicha Twala. The performers, the OSM Camarata with their artistic director, Mr. Marius Kutsier and their conductor, Ms. Elsie Raat, Ms. Luzanne Eichelaar, Dr. Anneke Lamont, Dr. Jan Beekes and Mr. Albertus Engelbrecht. Dr. Jan Beekes, Mrs. Ella Kotze, Mr. Ned Pretorius and Mr. Leon Snijman for logistics and communication. Langenhoven Park Dutch Reformed Church for the use of their venue in addition to the Odeon Concert Hall. Professor Nikol Fuljun for the programme notes and Mr. Evert Kleinhans of Roystoel and Mr. John Smith for the production of the recordings. We hope that you will enjoy this event with us. Uh, greetings to Professor Hudson, the Dean of the Faculty of the Humanities, uh, members of the Odeon School of Music, and uh, the community at large. Uh, we are so happy as the Faculty of the Humanities to be here today on this auspicious day whereby we are launching the book uh, by uh, Joe Sitlopers. I think this book it came at the right time and it is important that we do have such a publication in order to publicize the work and the lifetime of Jacobus Itlopos. What makes this uh, book and publication very important it is the fact that 11 authors contributed some chapters in this book and the other the editorship of Professor Martina Feldjun. This is a, a milestone for the School of Music and it is also a milestone for the university at large. We are so aesthetic that we can have this book launch uh, under the very serious uh, conditions of pandemic, but it is important also that the book itself, it is giving us a credible information and information pertaining to Jacobus Kloppers and the contribution he made in the whole uh, field of music. It is also important to note that in the publication itself, Kloppers also uh, played a significant role in as far as giving out information which is used in this publication. The information makes the publication to be special because in this publication, Kloppers is also having his own voice in terms of the interviews conducted with him and the material that he produced in order for the book to be published. We are so happy as the faculty, and as a faculty we say, bravo to the School of Music, and then we say, keep the, the fire burning, and then on behalf of the faculty, we say thank you, and then we say thanks very much to everybody who contributed to this, and then we make this publication a success. Thank you very much.
As an eminent composer, organist, pedagogue and scholar, Jacobus Klopper significantly contributed to musicological and organ teaching in South Africa and Canada and, in the latter context, art music and liturgical composition. His substantial oeuvre features numerous commissioned works that in notable instances were performed and recorded internationally, earning him wider acclaim and status as a composer. At the O'Donne School of Music, University of the Free State, since his departure for Canada in 1976, there has been a lasting impression of Klobers' contribution during the 1970s to transform this institution from a department mostly of regional relevance to one that introduced the discipline of systematic music studies to the broader South African musicological community and one that offered its students the benefit of Klopper's specialist knowledge on Bach's organ oeuvre and rhetorical studies. After Klopper's emigrated to Canada at the King's College in Edmonton, Alberta, now the King's University College, while helping to build this institution from its modest beginnings as a private Christian college to its current university status, Kloppers simultaneously played a significant role in Edmonton's music culture, for which he was inaugurated to Edmonton's Cultural Hall of Fame in 2008. The essays brought together in our book as a symbolic gesture collectively constitute recognition of Kloppers' work in South Africa and Canada. Our team of contributing authors includes colleagues from the Odeon School of Music, from the top left Jan Bierkes, Nicole Fulhoun, Martina Fulhoun, Mathilde Wiem, Elie de Ploy and Luzanne Eigelaar. Canadian colleagues who contributed are Dr. Charles Stolte, Associate Professor of Saxophone, Music Theory and Composition at the King's University College in Edmonton, where he now also heads the music division, and the husband and wife team, Drs. Joachim Zegger and Marnie Giesbrecht, also known as the celebrated keyboard team, Duyo Mayoya. Our final contributors, Isaac Groveer and Dani Strauss, each share a special connection with Kobi Kloppers. Groveer, an emeritus professor at Stellenbosch University, studied with Kloppers during his Bloemfontein years, later working closely with him as a colleague. Dani Strauss, the leading expert on Hermann Dueweer's theory of modal aspects internationally, taught a course during 1971 in the Dueweerian mode of thinking, which Kloppers attended that later significantly influenced his scholarly thought and in his teaching the integrality of faith and learning. The chapters offered in our book depart from differing philosophical and methodological perspectives. Contributions by Kloppers' Canadian colleagues proceed from the perspective of the Reformed tradition in North America and its vision for a culturally involved Christianity. Dani Strauss's chapter engages the Dutch heritage of that tradition, arguing the relevance of Dueweert's thought for Kloppers' academic teaching, also examining Calvin Seerfeld's influence. The musicological group of contributing authors had as our aim, apart from a biographical overview, the elimination of Kloppers' music as agency. As a collection of essays, the various contributions offer impressions of a corpus of work and a life that is one of devoted service in music. Kloppers' role in our documenting of his life and work needs to be acknowledged here. Studies based on compositional output seldom include commentary from the composer. Yet over the entire course of our endeavour, Kloppers generously shared information relevant to our work through a method that may perhaps best be described as one of cooperative heurism. This renders our project unique. As our chapters unfolded, the influence of Kloppers' life circumstances on his artistic oeuvre progressively came to the fore. Thus it became clear that a life and work publication, though focusing selectively on aspects of work, would do greater justice to the subject than a disciple, friends and colleagues type festschrift. More encompassing documentation of Kloppers' life and intellectual and artistic output would also contribute more substantially towards local music historiography writing.
Many of our guests tonight will know that Klopusch's adult life in South Africa coincided with the era of apartheid and how already during his postgraduate study in Germany, 1961 to 66, increasingly he became critical of the injustices of apartheid. As documented in our book, during his years at the University of the Orange Free State, 1966 to 1976, Kloppers publicly voiced his objection to apartheid's political ideology and practice on numerous occasions. These views resulted in him being stigmatized within Afrikaner intellectual circles and caused him to cross paths with the so-called special branch of the South African security police. Eventually, these developments gave rise to his decision to resign from his university position and his immigration to Canada with his family without the prospect of a professional position in that country. Kloppers came from a Christian Afrikaner background that brought him into profound conflict with his sense of social and moral justice. Ever since his undergraduate study, studies at the Potchefstroom University for Christian Higher Education, he was influenced by Reformational philosophy, its theocentric view of the nation, society and politics, and its focus on social justice. Together with critical perspectives gained during his years as organist in the Deutsche Evangelisch Reformierte Kirche Frankfurt am Main Süd from 1962 to 1966. Increasingly Kloppers and his wife Minzi faced an uncomfortable confrontation with the moral and ethical implications of apartheid. Yet, during one of our final conversations, he characterized himself as a true Afrikaner in the deep cultural sense of the word. As we found in our study of his works, being torn between his loyalty towards the Afrikaner nation and the moral convictions that led him to leave behind the country that was dear and near to him and his family was expressed most notably in the profound, almost militant inner conflict of his partita on Geneva Psalm 116, his large-scale work for piano reflections, prologue, variations and epilogue on an Afrikaans folk song, and his dialectic fantasy for organ, the latter two works forming part of the concert program presented later tonight. In their compositional fabric, while each of these works point to geographic, cultural and religious influences and traces of personal strife, suffering and acceptance, they reveal a complexity of musical materials, structure and expression. Indeed, they represent a densely constructed musical dialectic that, within the broader context of Kloppers' work, may be seen as a compelling and indelible compositional fingerprint. Within Reformational philosophy, aesthetic receptivity and the obedient aesthetic life are linked with social justice. However, though born from strong moral and ethical commitment, Kloppers' works do not embody overt social or political content. Even in Reflections, a pivotal work within his oeuvre, political commentary is subtle and operative on the deep structural symbolic level of representation rather than sensation. From the perspective of his reformed faith and philosophy, Kloppers' compositions have never been wielded as weapons of politically inspired protest, but rather, in an encompassing sense, they represent visions of eschatological hope. This correlates with Kloppers' view of his oeuvre to which religiosity is central. At this point our guests may wonder why, within the context of divine anticipation, the construct of nostalgia is an overarching theme to our volume. On some level, nostalgia denotes Kloppers' self-professed position of cultural insidedness and outsidedness. However, apart from representing a return to a lost and difficult past, nostalgia in his oeuvre may be understood in relation to a dialectic tension between what is radically incomplete in this life and what is beyond and transcendent. From this standpoint, nostalgia in Kloppers' oeuvre does not signify any expression of romanticized sentimentality. It does not involve revisiting his Afrikaner past as a return to foregone times of imagined happiness, stability or belonging. Instead, as suggested by the work presented here tonight, 
it may involve a re-examining of a personal or collective history that permits deep questioning, juxtaposing what was against what is faithfully hoped for. Good morning, Professor Klopesh. It is a privilege for me to do this interview with you as the subject of our book publication. Thank you so much for making your time available. And I remain hopeful that we will be able to celebrate the book again in a face-to-face -face meeting at a more opportune time. Good morning and thank you. I would like to begin the interview by discussing perspectives on the connection between life and work as explored in the publication. The introduction to the volume explains that the influence of your life circumstances on your artistic oeuvre progressively came to the fore as the chapters unfolded, and that this realisation prompted the life and work format of the publication. Your own involvement with the book's gestation over an extended period of time is also acknowledged in the publication. May I ask if new insights about the relationship between your life and work occur to you in the context of that process? They certainly did. Before the publication of the book, I've been aware of, to a certain degree, of this relationship. But the book, as well as the interviews that preceded it, brought it in sharper perspective. I will briefly mention this relationship with regard to my work in musicology, as well as my compositions. In musicology, the relationship between my life and work is evident as I moved from Potter's Room to Frankfurt to Bloemfontein and to Edmonton, at least with regard to my understanding and teaching of this discipline. In each milieu, I was intellectually challenged and shaped, forced to grapple with new ideas and concepts and to find answers. In the 2015 discussions in Bluefontein, I was also asked about my views and methodology in the teaching of musicology, which led to further reflection. Charles Stolte's interview regarding my musicological journey prompted me to revisit anew my views and how they were affected or modified by place and time. In my compositional work, I've been conscious to a certain degree of how my life and work related but there is much that happens subconsciously and which might be more obvious to the onlooker, hearer or observer of my music. I can mention an example of this. When I played a recital in Frankfurt in 1981 at the inauguration of the new von Beckerard organ in the Lutheran Friedenskirche, I included in the program my new partita on Psalm 116, which certainly conveyed a musical idiom use of timbre and emotional expression that markedly differed from my earlier Bach-inspired choral preludes. After hearing the work, <coughs> the wife of the organist, who had been a fellow student in Frankfurt at the time of my study with Valsha, and who had spent some time in South Africa with us, observed that my music has developed a new kind of mystical quality. And she wondered whether my work in the Anglican church was at the root of this. She contrasted this new style to what she described as the more lean, rational way of composing in the Lutheran tradition. In a similar way, I was forced to consciously look at the wider context of my music when interviewed by Martina Folyun, uh, Nicole Folyun and Jan Burgess. They made objective, contextual observations of the works that had never occurred to me. In reading the various analyses of my music in the book, I was struck again by the writer's keenness of observation and establishing connections between the work and my life circumstances. One of those connections that stand out quite starkly is the event of your immigration to Canada. It comes to the fore in the book as a great rupture, not merely because of the obvious loss of intimacy with friends and family, the hiatus in your career, and all the quotidian challenges of a relocation, but especially because of the painful ideological journey that led to your decision. If I calculated correctly, you have now lived longer in Canada than in South Africa. Uh, that is correct. Looking back today, how would you describe your relationship with South Africa and with Canada respectively? 
I was raised in an Afrikaner family and will always remain an Afrikaner with strong ties to the Afrikaans language and culture and to South Africa. I'm proud of my Afrikaner heritage. Our children have the same love for South Africa and the Afrikaans language. Our adopted country, Canada, has been very good to us and welcoming. This was especially true with regard to the Anglican community of St. John's in Edmonton, who accepted us unconditionally and helped us as a family in every way possible. We feel at home here as Canadian citizens and love the country, its beauty and diversity, but above all its tolerance and welcoming nature towards newcomers, its multicultural policies. This does not mean that it is flawless, as we in time discovered. Every country has its wrongs and injustices, past and present. Of importance is whether it deals with these wrongs and whether it is endeavoring to create a better and just society. <coughs> Excuse me. In the past, settlers of Canada, <coughs> like most colonials, tended to occupy the land and impose a European style of living at the expense of its indigenous peoples. They made treaties with indigenous peoples that were not always honored. They instituted an advanced farming and industrial infrastructure, including exploration and distribution of natural resources, which sometimes proved to be detrimental to the natural habitat and life of the indigenous people. Furthermore, starting towards the end of the 19th century, the government imposed on the indigenous population a policy of assimilation into the English French Christian culture by means of church run residential schools, which proved devastating to their faith and language, this physical, psychological, and cultural well being. Only in the last decades were these injustices recognized by the government and churches and an effort was started towards compensation and reconciliation. The Anglican Church, of which we are members and in which I've served as organist since my arrival, is part of that healing process. The King's University, in which I taught for 35 years, continues to play an important role as well in promoting social justice and shalom. Apart from indigenous issues, there are also elements of hidden racism and gender-based mistreatment in Canada that need to be addressed. It is important, however, to point out that the tie that binds people together in Canada is different from the one in the traditional South Africa of my youth. Canada is a land of immigrants from every corner of the earth and as heterogeneous as can be imagined, in terms of ethnicity, customs, and faith. Multiculturalism, tolerance, a respect for democracy, and a love for the country's natural beauty are some of the binding forces. This heterogeneous Canadian society was something we had to get used to, since the one in apartheid South Africa in which we grew up constituted a rather homogenous Afrikaans-speaking nation almost an extended family, united by the reformed faith, being descendant of Huguenots and foot trackers with an almost unbreakable tie to the land and with a perceived divine task to bring Christianity to this continent. Our interactions with the English speaking South Africans was rather infrequent and with a non-white population limited to black servants or to missionary work. With regard to our relation to South Africa after moving to Canada, we kept in touch with family and musical colleagues in South Africa after our departure in 1976. Above all, we trusted and prayed that the inevitable socio-political change will be a peaceful one. We rejoiced in the new moves towards an inclusive democracy and in the ultimate change in 1994, which was peaceful thanks to Mandela's extraordinary moral example of forgiveness. We also rejoiced in the enviable new South African constitution and in the process of the truth and conciliation which was followed, instead of a Nuremberg style post-apartheid reckoning. Mm -hmm. We also rejoiced in the fact that the Afrikaner people once again proved to be adaptable to new circumstances 
and the various efforts by groups to collaborate and make things work were admirable. Apart from family, close contact remained with South African musical colleagues and friends, the Udeon School of Music in particular, with the Southern Afrikaans Kerk and Kerkorist Vereniging, Sarkov, and former students. Further to the idea of your continued involvement with South Africa, in the introduction and afterward, Martina Fulyun poses the question of your place in the post-apartheid musical landscape in a highly nuanced way, concluding that while you do not see yourself as associated with mainstream South African composers or local compositional practices, you have an ongoing role to play within local music studies and performance. Yeah, she is correct. The genres that I indulge in have been mostly smaller ones, such as organ chorale preludes, or works for organ and other mediums, such as choirs, the piano, saxophone, and so forth, which are not mainstream art music, such as symphonies, string quartets, opera, and so forth. This does not mean disassociation with mainstream music, which I love and admire, but my life and work for pragmatical reasons have centered largely around church music and especially the organ, an instrument which is unfortunately not always appreciated or understood even by pianists, neither promoted in the way it deserves. My compositional work is also not stylistically part of an esoteric avant-garde music, such as sonic experimentations or trance music. Sonic experimentation is not a field in which I will experiment, but rather continue in a style that is more new classic or new romantic. Still, in terms of mainstream music, I have in recent times branched out towards concert hall genres, such as organ duets, concerti, and orchestral suites, and we will see where this will lead. Absolutely. Martina explains how your works, with the exception of reflections, prologue variations and epilogue on an Afrikaans folk song, which we'll hear performed later in the program, do not embody overt social or political content and that you seek to serve the ideal of a just world, not through politically inspired protest in your music, but rather through an encompassing vision of eschatological hope. Would you like to comment on that? I agree with Martina's assessment. The piano piece Reflections did not try to make a political statement. It came into existence after the death of my mother in 1997, which signified for me, together with a change to an inclusive democracy in South Africa in 1994, the end of a socio-political era that lasted many decades. The work sprung from an empathy with my Afrikaner people's ideals the established understanding of his past, their sufferings and achievements, but also their illusions in the unjust apartheid era. Regardless of my rejection of the way the Afrikaner government tried to secure political and cultural security by means of the apartheid system, I naturally understood how the Afrikaners view their history and I empathized with the ultimate disillusionment with a realization that the dream of socio-political independence has faded. Although there is much expression of pain and disillusionment in reflections written in 1998, it also speaks of courage, hope and acceptance, adaptability, even when there are still lingering questions about the future of the Afrikaans culture without any political security. Is it important to you that South Africa should have a place in your legacy as a composer? Absolutely. I'm deeply indebted to South Africa and will love to continue to contribute in my own way to its rich musical culture. And I can add, long may you be able to do so. It now remains for me to thank you once again for your participation in this interview, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the program with us. Thanks so much. Thank you.